Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to be looking this morning at Jesus' words, now famously known as the Great Commission. And as we come to hear God speak to us through His Word, let us pray. Father, I pray that You would thunder Your Word this morning from this pulpit uh, into all of our hearts by Your Spirit. And we ask this in the name of Your Son, our Savior, who lives and reigns with You and the Holy Spirit, one God forever praised. Amen. The cannibals, you'll be eaten by cannibals. Those were the words spoken to the Scottish missionary John Patton in 1858 before he left the Hebrides Islands of Scotland to evangelize the cannibals of the outer New Hebrides, the islands now known as Vanuatu. It took John Patton six months to get there by sea. Within five months of arriving on one of the islands called Tana, his wife Mary and newly born son, Peter Robert Robson, both died of tropical fever. After he buried them, Patton spent nights sleeping on their graves to protect their bodies from the cannibals. After four years, the natives drove him from the island. Years later, he remarried and returned to a different island known as Aniwa. He and his new wife, Maggie, found the cannibals on that island much the same as the cannibals on Tana. He wrote in his journal, the same superstitions, the same cannibalistic cruelties and depravities, the same barbaric mentality, the same lack of altruistic or human humanitarian impulses were in evidence. He and Maggie, his new wife, had ten children, four of whom died in infancy. Yet despite all of this, John Patton and his wife remained on that island and labored for Christ. He learned the Aniwa language. He wrote it down. He translated the New Testament into Aniwa. And by the end of their life, after many decades of hard labor, the entire island of Aniwa professed Christianity. In 1899, the Aniwa New Testament was completed. Just think about the cost to John Patton. He left his family in Scotland, never to return to live there. He lost his first wife and numerous children. He had malaria 14 times, and the cannibals threatened his own life. What does a man from the outer Hebrides Islands of Scotland, what possesses a man to go from that region of the world to the other side of the world to disciple cannibals, especially when it's at the cost of his own wife and children? I mean, what would possess a man to do that? And that is only the story of one man. If I had time this morning, I could talk about William Carey or Amy Carmichael, missionaries to India, Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, David Brainard, missionary to the North American Indians, Elizabeth Elliot, missionary to the Alka tribe who murdered her husband and four other missionaries. We could talk of David Livingston, missionary to Africa, Helen Rosevere, doctor to the Congo. Richard Johnson, Samuel Marsden, missionaries to Australia, New Zealand, Darlene Diebler Rose, missionary to Papua New Guinea, Charles Beatty, graduate of the Log College in Neshemini, just up the road here, missionary to the frontier settlements of Pennsylvania. And on and on we could go, men and women who spent their lives reaching the lost peoples of this world. Some risked their lives, some literally gave their lives to disciple the peoples of this world. Why? What possessed them? And where did they get such inspiration and courage from in the midst of great hardship and trial? Well, the answer lies in these verses from Matthew 28, now commonly known as the Great Commission. We can understand Jesus' words here under three simple headings. Number one, the great claim. 
Jesus Christ is Lord of everything, everywhere. The great claim, Jesus Christ is Lord of everything, everywhere. Verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Notice the first word of the great commission, all. The word dominates these verses. It's used four times. We have all authority, all nations, all of Jesus' teaching, all the days of, his li- of our lives. Here in verse 18, the focus is on all authority, the totality of Jesus' authority. He has been given not some authority over some things, but all authority over everything. He has political authority. He is Lord over President Trump and Joe Biden. He's Lord over Her Majesty the Queen, over Boris Johnson, over Vladimir Putin, over Kim Jong-un. It means He has military authority. He's Lord over the President of the United Nations. He's Lord over President Xi of China, who boasts of having the largest army in the world. It means he has existential authority. He is Lord of the whole of human existence. As Abraham Kuyper put it, there is not a square inch of the whole of our human existence over which Christ does not cry, it's mine. It means he has epistemological authority over all research and all science and all thinking. He decides how we know what we know. It means He has educational authority over all our children. It means He has ethical authority over marriage and the child in the womb. Jesus is Lord of everything. All authority has been given to me. He's Lord of the whole shebang. But that's not all, no pun intended. He's also Lord of everything, everywhere. Notice the prepositional phrase, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It's a merism, meaning everywhere. All authority everywhere has been given to me. Geographically, He is Lord of Philadelphia and the Philippines, Manhattan and Madras, the Serengeti and the Sahara, heaven as well as earth. This is the great claim of Jesus as He meets His disciples on a mountain in the backwater region of Galilee. He is Lord of everything, everywhere. Now, note the timing of this claim by Jesus because it's important. He makes this great claim about receiving all authority in heaven and on earth after His resurrection and just before His ascension. But we must not think that this means that before His resurrection, Jesus didn't have any authority. Matthew shows us earlier in his gospel that Jesus had authority over His teaching, chapter 7, over sin, chapter 9, over demons and the sick, chapter 10. So what then does Jesus mean here when He says, all authority in heaven and earth has now been given to me? Well, I think He's referring to the scope of His authority. It's been enlarged, hence the word all, and hence the phrase, in heaven and on earth. The change in authority here is not qualitative, it's quantitative. The spheres over which Jesus exercises authority have been enlarged. He now, as the God-man, has authority over all things in all places. We should also note the location of this claim, not just the timing. Do you notice there in verse 16, He makes it on a mountain. On another mountain in Matthew, Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world, offering them to him if he would just bow down and worship him there and then. But Jesus refused. Instead, he served and worshiped his Father only. He refused the shortcut to glory and took the long road to glory, which involves suffering even on to death. And as a reward for that perfect and entire life of obedience, Jesus, on another mountain, 
announces that he has received all authority in heaven and on earth. We should hear hear an echo of Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, where one like the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days and receives dominion over all the kingdoms of the world. And alongside that allusion to Daniel 7, we should see the allusion to Adam in Genesis. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth and then appointed Adam as king over everything, everywhere on Mount Eden. And here is Jesus on a mountain in Galilee, the last Adam, having received all authority in heaven and on earth, Lord over everything, everywhere. The location, as well as the timing, is important. And so, this is the great claim that Jesus begins the Great Commission with. He is Lord of everything, everywhere. And this is what our secular, pluralistic culture hates with a vengeance. Our secular culture absolutely hates this great claim of Jesus. The nations rage and the peoples plot. The kings of the earth take their stand against the Lord and against His anointed one, Jesus Christ. We see this in two ways. Our secular culture loves to privatize Jesus' authority. It says Jesus' authority is a private matter not a public matter. Secularism pushes religious belief to the periphery of society and into the privacy of hearts. Secularism says, you can have your Jesus is Lord mantra. Just keep it to yourself. Jesus can be Lord, so long as by that you mean that He is Lord of your heart, not mine. It's a private matter, not a public matter. But as we can see from verse 18, Jesus isn't interested in secularism's proposal. He's not just Lord of the private heart. He's Lord of the public square. He's Lord every, over everything, everywhere, which means His authority is not a private matter, but a public matter. I think this was most strikingly seen when Her Majesty the Queen was coronated in Westminster Abbey in 1953. That day, as she walked down the aisle of Westminster Abbey, she actually walked past her throne and knelt down at an altar for a moment of private prayer. It was a private prayer. Nobody heard what she said. But it was a public statement because engraved on that altar where she knelt to pray were the words, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ. It was a private prayer, but it was a public statement broadcast to 20 million people in Britain, all watching it on their brand new TVs. What was the queen saying? She was saying, Jesus Christ is Lord of everything, everywhere, and it is no private matter. The kingdoms of this world are the kingdoms of Jesus Christ. Another way our culture likes to handle Jesus' great claim here is to relativize it. Our secular culture tries to privatize it. Our pluralistic culture tries to relativize it. It says, oh, that's a wonderful truth that you hold about Jesus, having all authority, so long as you don't actually think it's true for everyone. That is how our pluralistic culture thinks. You've got your truth, your version of reality. I've got mine. You with your truth in your small corner, me with my truth in my small corner. As a philosophy, religious pluralism wants us to live our lives like we live in one of those big inflatable see-through balls in the carnival or the fun park. You know the ones where you get inside the ball and they blow it up with air and zip it up, and then you can walk around in this ball on water or in grass, and other people do the same thing. And it's all very peaceful because you're in your bubble and they're in theirs, so long as you don't bump into each other. All is peaceful 
So long as you keep your truth to yourself and they keep their truth to themselves, all is well. But just as with the first attempt to privatize Jesus' authority, so now with this attempt to relativize it, Jesus isn't open to it. His authority is not something to be relativized as one truth among others, as one reality among others. And that's because Jesus didn't rise from the dead in a bubble. The world in which we live is the world in which Jesus rose from the dead. And therefore, it is over this world that God gave him all authority in heaven and on earth. And in this sense, the only people living in a bubble are those who refuse to submit to his authority. When the queen knelt that day before the altar, she wasn't living in a bubble. She was living in the real world. She was getting in line with the only true reality that governs the world. She was submitting to Jesus Christ as Lord of everything, everywhere. This is Christ's great claim. And it serves as the foundation for the great commission, which brings us to our second point. The great claim, Jesus is Lord of everything, everywhere. And second, the great commission. Very creative of me, I know. The great claim, the great commission. Go, therefore, and disciple all nations, verses 19 and 20. Notice the therefore at the beginning of verse 19. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. The therefore is important. The Great Commission does not bring about the great claim. The great claim brings about the great commission. I remember years ago hearing an illustration to do with mission that went something like this. The Bible teacher was using an image of mission from a previous century, and he said, people ask me, what is mission? And I say to them, mission is getting in your canoe, paddling up the river, getting out and asking, is Jesus Lord here? If not, preach the gospel. Get back in your canoe, paddle up the river, get out and ask, is Jesus Lord here? If not, preach the gospel. Do you see the problem with that presentation of mission? It turns Jesus' great claim into His great hope. It makes the Great Commission sound more like a great expectation. Go and disciple the nations, baptizing and teaching them. And if you do, then I will gain more authority in heaven and earth when that tribe up the river submits to my lordship. But that's not what Jesus says in the Great Commission. He's not waiting to become Lord of the tribe up the river. He is Lord of the tribe up the river. He's Lord of the tribe up the river, whether they know it or not, whether they like it or not, whether they recognize it or not. And that is why we go to the tribe up the river and to every tribe up every river, because Jesus Christ is Lord of everyone, everywhere. Now, of course, there's an important distinction or qualification needed here between the objective reality of Jesus' lordship and the subjective experience of Jesus' lordship. I'm not promoting some kind of Bartian view of the world where everyone's a Christian under Jesus' lordship, and the job of mission is just to go around and wake people up by faith to the reality that is theirs already. No, what this objective reality of Jesus' lordship means is not that everyone's a Christian. No, what it means is that there are two types of people in the world. There are Christians and there are rebels. Christians are those who, are, who by God's grace, have repented, submitted themselves to Jesus as Lord. Non-Christians are those who have chosen to rebel against Him as Lord, or at least against their Creator. But let's be clear, Jesus is Lord of both, Christian 
and non-Christian. And that is the way in which Jesus is speaking here. He's not speaking of the subjective experience of His Lordship. He's speaking of the objective reality that He is Lord of everyone, everywhere. And that is what makes, that is the foundation for the Great Commission. The Great Commission does not bring about the Great Claim. The Great Claim brings about the Great Commission. The word therefore is important, which therefore brings us to the Great Commission itself. It really consists in two very simple commands, go and disciple. The order is important. First we go, then we disciple. Uh, in the Brethren Assembly in which I was brought up in, we had a teacher who used to say that if you take the go out of gospel, you're left in a spell. Uh, his simple point was that if the church loses its missionary initiative in going to the nations, then we're just left in the spell of our introspection and intramural debates. I remember I loved the point. And then I took Greek 1 and 2 at Moore College. And of course, I became a Greek expert overnight. There's only one imperative in the Great Commission, not two. Jesus only tells us to disciple. He doesn't tell us to go. The text literally means going disciple. And so, I couldn't wait till I got to preach on Matthew 28. And there I was critiquing this old brethren man saying, you don't need to go to the nations. You just need to evangelize and disciple wherever you go. The text literally means going disciple. And then I took Greek 3. <laughs> <laughs> and realized that my dear old brethren man who had no Greek had got the Greek right because the participle of attendant circumstance can carry the mood of the imperative. <laughs> and so here I was left in a spell. And the point of all that is to say that going is part of gospeling. Going is part of gospeling. And yes, if we take the go out of gospel we are left in the spell of our own intramural debates. And brothers and sisters, this is our heritage at Westminster. We stand in the tradition of old Princeton, which was a minister training seminary and also a missionary training seminary. Westminster exists in that tradition to train men and women to be servants of the Word as we seek to disciple the nations of the world to the glory of God. If our graduates don't go to the nations, then we are not obeying the Christ of the nations. Yes, it's very nice to have these flags on the wall here that represent all the nations to which our graduates have gone over the years, but flags on walls do not necessarily constitute missionaries on the field. It's very easy to have flags on a wall. But the question is, will Westminster have missionaries on the fields? May Christ be pleased to use this seminary again as an incubator for missionaries to be sent out to the four corners of the world and to every nation on the way. So the going is important, but so too is what we do when we get there. We go and disciple the nations. Go, therefore, and disciple all nations. The verb disciple means to make a person into a learner, a submissive pupil. It involves conversion, but it is not merely conversion. Jesus doesn't just want numbers. He wants followers, learners, people who understand and love His teaching. That's what discipleship means. And yet, he also wants the numbers. You see that? All nations. Here we have the word all again. 
The word nation could be uh, ethnic groups or people groups, or it could be translated nations, as in countries. I think the former is more likely. Jesus is bringing to fulfillment the promise to Abraham, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And as I said, He wants every family, every people group to be blessed with the gospel. The all-encompassing authority of Jesus leads to the all-inclusive scope of the command. Universal lordship leads to universal mission. And the mission is discipleship. Now, this idea of Christians evangelizing, discipling people from other nations, is a deeply offensive thing in our religiously pluralistic culture. I remember when I was a physiotherapist or physical therapist, as you say here in the States, uh, doing one of my placements when I was a student. Uh, I was heading off to India at the end of this uh, placement, and I was speaking to one of the ladies, uh, my supervisor, uh, who I worked with, and she said to me, uh, I hope you're not going to India to convert people there. And I told her that that's why I was going to India. Uh, she said, I think that's terrible. They have their own religion. You have yours. Why do you think they need to convert to your religion? And I remember in that moment in the corridor of the hospital feeling so awkward as I tried to sort of answer this woman's point to me. And I was fumbling around for an explanation, thinking, she's giving me my marks next week. Should I leave the answer? to? to I, let's talk about that in two weeks' time. Uh, but as I reflected on that conversation and on our culture's general stance against evangelism and missions, I've realized that there are two important responses that we can use when we experience things like that. First, everyone is involved in some kind of evangelism, discipleship. The physio lady that day was giving off about me evangelizing people in India, but did you notice what she was doing to me? She was evangelizing me. She was trying to convert me to her position that all faiths are equal, and therefore no one has a right to change another person's views. But you see the connection? In making such a claim, she herself was trying to make a convert. As Tim Keller says, everyone in the world is an evangelist. Even telling someone they can't proselytize is a form of proselytizing. So it's not whether or not we'll all be involved in evangelism or discipleship. It's just which kind. And second, everyone believes in some kind of absolute. A physio lady said that the reason I was not to evangelize people in India was because they had their own religion and I had mine and we should leave it at that. But think about what she was assuming when she made that claim. She was assuming that all faiths are equal and therefore there's no one faith superior to another faith. But notice what she was not saying. She was not saying that I and the Hindus believed in the same God. We just expressed it differently. She was happy to admit there were different religions, but her point was no one religion is superior to another. In, all, in other words, truth is relative. Truth is subjective. It's what you want it to be. You in your small bubble of truth, me in mine, and they in theirs. But do you see the great irony in her argument? In thinking like this, she just stated an absolute truth to which I had to submit, and that was that there are no absolute truths. The statement that all truth is relative is an absolute truth. The statement that all faiths are equal is an absolute faith statement. So it's not whether or not we'll make absolute statements. It's just which absolute statement will make. So next time you have an awkward conversation about the rights or legitimacy of Christian evangelism or missions or discipleship with that family member or friend or work colleague, let me encourage you to gently point out that the pluralistic emperor has got no clothes on. Everyone tries to evangelize. Everyone makes absolute statements. The issue is which absolute statement is true. And therefore, which evangelism is not just right, but which is best for the world. So, as Christians, we've got nothing to hide. 
nothing to be embarrassed about, because we are operating on the basis of Jesus' claim that he is Lord of everyone, everywhere. And this is why John Patton didn't leave the cannibals of the outer New Hebrides to themselves. This is why William Carey and Amy Carmichael went to the Hindus of India, even though they already had millions of other gods to worship. That's why Hudson Taylor wouldn't leave the Chinese to their Confucianism or Buddhism. That's why David Brainard wouldn't leave the North American Indians to their worship, or Elizabeth Elliot to the Alka tribe worshiping their own gods in creation. It's why David Livingston and Helen Roosevelt wanted to go and challenge the animistic worship of Africans. And it's why we should not leave our friends and family and neighbors and the peoples of this earth to their idolatrous worship, because Jesus Christ is Lord of everyone, everywhere. But the Great Commission doesn't just end with go and disciple all the nations. You'll notice there in verse 19 that Jesus unpacks it in two ways, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. These are the means by which we disciple the nations. In the first, we are to baptize people into the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, this is a water baptism, not a spiritual baptism, as some like to think. Uh, but of course, there's some disagreement among the water Baptists. Is it credo or pedo? That is the question. Well, this was one of the verses that actually helped me move from being a convinced credo Baptist to being a pedo-baptist. I couldn't get away from the order of the participles, baptizing, then teaching. In my credo-baptist upbringing, it had been first teaching, and only after a person had proved themselves to be converted was it then baptizing. And yet Jesus reverses the order, which I don't think is ad hoc. It's first baptism, then teaching. Of course, this is also true for adults who are converted out of a pagan background. It's baptism, and then it's teaching. In either case, the order supports the pedo-baptist position. It's the same order of circumcision in the Old Testament. The Israelites were first circumcised on the eighth day, and then they were taught. Now, if you're a Baptist here, I know this is really irritating you, <coughs> uh, but you can always hope for heaven. Okay? when we will all have complete knowledge and be finally perfect, Presbyterians. <clears throat> but whether you believe in infant baptism or believer's baptism, and I pray that by the end of your four years, you might move from the deep end of the pool to the shallow end of the pool. Uh, it's warmer there. But whatever your view of baptism… Let's all see at least that it is fundamental to the Great Commission. Do you see that? It's fundamental to discipleship. We baptize people. This is the first aspect of discipleship. The second is teaching, verse 19, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And notice Jesus is not just simply encouraging head knowledge. He wants heart obedience. We are to teach everything He's commanded so that people observe everything that He commanded. The goal is not just knowledgeable disciples, but obedient disciples. So those are the two means of discipleship, water baptism and water teaching. Now, if we take a step back just for a moment and think about Jesus' great commission, then it perhaps should really be dubbed the daunting commission, because this is a formidable task, isn't it? All people groups. I looked up last night on the internet the Joshua Project. It's a great website to talk about the unreached people groups. They say there are 17,104 people groups in the world, and currently 7,162 are unreached. Jesus tells us, to go to all of them. And when we get there, He tells us to disciple all of them, not just convert them, 
which is a deeply offensive thing to do in our religiously pluralistic culture, but it's also a deeply arduous task to do because we are to teach them the whole counsel of God, which means that this will take years of our lives, decades of our lives, if we are going to disciple the nations. And not just that, we are to exhort them to observe what He has commanded, not just to know Him, but to obey Him. And when, as we know in our own lives, sanctification is a slow process. So, no wonder this is called the Great Commission, because it's going to take a great effort and a great cost. Now, I don't know if you feel like me when you read the Great Commission sometimes. I feel overwhelmed, uh, discouraged. I think this is impossible. This is unrealistic. Well, Jesus knows that how, that is how we would feel, and so He ends His great commission with a great comfort, the great claim, Jesus is Lord of everything, everywhere, the great commission, go therefore and disciple the nations, and now, third, the great comfort, Jesus will be with us every day until the end. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus' great claim leads to the great commission, but it comes with a great comfort. The word all has dominated these verses, all authority, all nations, all of Jesus' teaching. And now, here is the last one, all days until the end of the age, or as one commentator puts it, the whole of every day until the end of the age. The Great Commission is really the great co-mission. Jesus promises to be with us side by side every step of the way. And here I think Matthew ends his gospel where he began it. Jesus' name is Emmanuel, God with us. But I think for most of us this morning, we don't really feel the comfort of these verses because our lives are so comfortable. The only trials we will face this week are midterms, or worse, having to prepare lectures. <laughs> this evening, we'll all return to our comfortable rooms, we'll update our Facebook profile, we'll phone our friends, we'll eat some nice food, we'll get into our comfortable beds. And the promise of Jesus will become a very faint whisper in our lives. But if we are going to get serious about evangelism, about mission, about the Great Commission, then our lives are going to involve hardship, just like the life of John Patton and all those other missionaries that I've mentioned. If you don't believe me, then just read the book of Acts where the Great Commission begins to be played out, and at every advance of the gospel, what was there? Opposition, hardship, persecution. Jesus is sending us out into a world that hates the exclusivity of His claim to have all authority in heaven and on earth. It hates the purity of His teaching on things like marriage and sex and the child in the womb. The hardship for us might not be the threat of cannibals, but it will be the threat of persecution, perhaps maybe imprisonment by the PC police or the intolerista media who are abounding more and more. And we need to hear these words of Jesus now so that when those days come, or for some of you, you know this better than we do in the West, when you return to your country and you feel that threat of persecution every day, you will need these words, Behold, I am with you every day to the end of the age. I mentioned earlier that soon after John Patton arrived on the islands of the outer New Hebrides, he buried his wife and child. As a result, he uh, nearly lost his mind. He wrote in his journal, had it not been the abiding consciousness of the presence and power of my dear Lord and Savior, nothing else in all the world could have preserved me 
from losing my reason and perishing miserably. And then he quoted Matthew 28, 20. And lo, I am with thee always to the ends of the age. And my prayer has been, as I've prepared this sermon, that in five or 10 or 15 or 20 years, wherever we are in the world, however we are involved in evangelism or discipleship or world mission, may God by His Spirit bring these words of Matthew 28 and blow them like a gentle breeze into the furnace of our hardships. And surely I am with you the whole of every day until the end of the age. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, as we have heard the word of Your Son, please grant uh, by Your Spirit's help and grace and power that we would not just be hearers of it, but doers also. We ask this for the sake of His name who lives and reigns with You and the Holy Spirit, one God forever praised. Amen.